So our next guest, we've had him on our show before. It's Dr. Chiu Pandan. He's going to be talking about sleep and mental health. Dr. Chirak is a board certified pulmonologist and a critical care medicine specialist. Dr. Chirag is currently serving as a medical director of critical care and respiratory therapy at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care in Pleasanton, California. Dr. Chirag is also certified and trained in sleep medicine and interventional pulmonology focused on advanced procedures, including endobronchial valve placement. He's also another dear friend of mine, so I'm super excited to have him on. Hi, Dr. Chirag, are you there? Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And thank you for taking time away from the family. I know you were busy today and you gave us <laughs> a wonderful time to, uh, to help the world. No, thank you. Thanks for having me, Sheila and uh, Neil, for uh, the opportunity again. It's nice to be back. Uh, you guys are doing wonderful work. And, you know, uh, just like I, I had a chance to listen uh, part of the last talk from uh, Mr. Lock Loy. And like, just like you said, you know, COVID has, COVID has really changed our uh, mindset. A lot more time to do thinking, a lot more time to do things other than what we have been doing. Just pause and do what we can for our health. So, um, I think that's that's very really true, and definitely lasagna. I think I'm going to ask for lasagna for dinner tonight. So thanks for bringing that up too. <laughs> that was a, that was a good good reference there. Very good. Um, so uh, I think I think uh, you know um, when it comes to mental health and overall generalized health, I think sleep is probably one of the areas that's more important than you know any other and any other parts of our health and. There is so much out there to learn about sleep. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, frankly, um, what our body, what our mind, what our physiological systems do when we sleep um, uh, affects so much of our, you know, health in general. And that's where I think um, uh, one of the major part is our mental health. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to mental health, sleep plays a major role. So um, I, I have created a few slides that I'll share with you guys just to kind of go over a few things here. And then I think we can probably, you know, open the forum for some discussion there. Um, let me yeah. see if I can share my screen here. Is that okay? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm so glad that we're, we're talking about sleep because a lot of people are really having a difficult time. Like my patients are having a very difficult time sleeping. So um, this is going to be very useful for a lot of people. So thank you, Dr. Chirac. No, no problem at all. Uh, can you guys see the screen okay? Yes, we can. Is it there? Good, mm -hmm. good, good. So sleep is very, you know, very uh, near and dear to me because um, uh, the whole physiology of breathing, uh, ventilation, and that, uh, that taking place during sleep and how it impacts our overall health has been very intriguing to me since the beginning when I started to, you know, learn medicine and since I was a medical student. Um, so I, I just came across a few things that I think I put together. Um, and, you know, um, what I'll try to do is just kind of see what, you know, normal, what normal sleep pattern is and how, how disturbance in the normal sleep pattern can impact mental health and our health in general. Um, so when it comes to, you know, a normal sleep or sleep pattern in general, um, I think uh, it's important to just kind of get a good review about sleep cycle. And what sleep cycle is, is basically um, a rotation of these different stages that our brain goes through when we are sleeping at night. And those are called sleep stages. And each cycle is roughly about close to 90 minutes uh, when we are sleeping. And in a normal sleep, about seven hours or six to eight hours window, usually will go through about four to five sleep cycles. And each particular sleep cycle, if you look at it, it starts with all these different stages. If you look at the left side of the image, W stands for wake stage or awake stage. Um, then you will go into N1 or stage one sleep, which lasts for about a about very really short period of time. You're looking at about 10 minutes or so. Then you go to N2 sleep, which is the stage two sleep. That's where we pretty much spend most of the time when we're sleeping about 50 to 60% of total time through the night and 50 to 60% of time for each particular sleep cycle. And then you will go at the end to REM sleep or dream sleep, um, which is right here. Uh, you see that red thick bar, which shows at the end. 
And in between these stages, we'll spend some time in M3 or stage three, which is the deep sleep. Deep sleep is where we can call it as a restful sleep. So the part of the sleep that gives us rest, sort of rejuvenation for next day or the next 12, 14, 18 hours, that's the stage three or M3 sleep. And that plays a major role for uh, giving us the restful sleep. REM sleep, or a lot of times is called as a dream sleep, is where the dreams occur. And dreams play a major role in building our memory, building our overall brain development for kids and teenagers as well. So this is a particular cycle that we go through each lasts for about 90 minutes. And if you look at it in a typical, again, seven to eight hour sleep cycle, some people sleep close to six hours, some people close to eight hours, but usually are within that six to eight hours window. And we go through these stages throughout the night. And in between every stage, there is about a few minutes or a few seconds of our brain is actually awake. And a lot of times we remember waking up and going back to sleep again, which could be part of the normal process when you go from one sleep cycle to another sleep cycle. In this particular example, you can see that you have four REM periods, four deep sleep, deep sleep stage period, and then you know, you awake in the beginning and awake at the end. That's the ideal way or, you know, the best way possible. However, if someone wakes up about a couple of times at night, but as long as you can fall asleep, when you're switching these cycles, that's completely normal pattern. Now, anything that will cause disturbance in this pattern, um, whether, whether it's a mental illness or physical illness, and we'll talk about this a little bit, will break this cycle, which is what our brain our brain needs, our body needs to maintain through the night. And whenever there is a break in this pattern, you're looking at having less sleep or sleep deprivation. And this sleep, sleep deprivation will have all the effects on our body, whether it's mental or physical, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I just wanted to put it out there as a basic structure because the goal is to maintain this structure, this cycle. Once we are there, then you're looking at the restful sleep, uh, and, you know, um, best mental health possible related to sleep as long as this cycle is maintained. Another example, just to kind of put a pattern out there for dream sleep versus non-dream sleep or REM sleep versus non-REM sleep. You can see the tips of these. Each peak has a portion which shows REM sleep or dream sleep, which is about, about 15 to 20 percent of our total sleep throughout the night. So um, the time we spend dreaming is at least about 15% or so. A lot of times we don't even remember those dreams, um, which is completely normal. Um, a lot of times we do remember if they are close to the time we are waking up in the morning, they're likely we are going to remember them. But this is the pattern that our brain goes through through the dream. And again, it's a major, major portion uh, um, of our sleep, which plays a role for short-term memory or even long-term memory in general. That's the dream sleep. So as I mentioned, again, sleep is directly linked, and many of you are aware, no with better. our mental function no as well as no the uh, physical, fun, uh, you know, physical health. So both of those things um, are affected by your sleep, no matter, no matter you know, uh, what level a uh, particular individual is affected. Uh, sorry about the uh, slide here. There's a little bit uh, stretched out. I apologize. Um, but I just wanted to put it out there for physical impact of sleep as well and sleep deprivation or poor sleep. And this is the part that I find very intriguing that how not sleeping well for a long time or even short time can have, can have an impact on so many portions of our body, so many systems on, of our body. And it's pretty much every physiologic or mental system that you can think of. So cognitive impact, memory loss, um, overall, hallucinations, a lot of times attention deficit, a lot of kids, teenagers being diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, um, a lot of people being diagnosed with depression, they could all have underlying poor sleep quality and sleep deprivation, impaired immune system, getting infections, heart disease, stroke, irregular heartbeat, as well as risk of diabetes, as well as a lot of data coming out that impact on the immune system now leading to some risk of cancer as well. So in general, it impacts pretty much every system on the body um, when you have poor sleep or sleep deprivation. So when it comes to mental illness, I think this is probably 
is one of my favorite slides that I share with a lot of my patients um, uh, who are dealing with poor sleep or sleep deprivation in general, that this is a vicious cycle. Not sleeping well is your vicious cycle that just continues to go in the circle, keeps going on and on and on. It starts with any kind of stress, any kind of worry they have, which could be something that could be an acute event in life, or it could be an ongoing thing that they're dealing with, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's because of other reason, it directly causes impact on sleep. And a lot of times patients or people are not even aware that they have something that is stressing them out that they may not be necessarily thinking when they're going to bed or when they're going to sleep. However, um, that plays a major role, just having that worry and back of the mind um, as stress and that affects the sleep. Sleep is going to cause more tiredness. More tiredness is going to have low energy, poor attention during the day, poor function in general, more irritability leads to more low, low esteem, depression, and that adds more stress. So this cycle is the one that plays a major role when it comes to sleep and mental health. And identifying this, working on the stressors, eventually improves sleep, which eventually then improves the factors which are causing the stress and makes it worse. And this is the list of all these things that mental health uh, can be affected at a different level if the sleep is impaired, whether you're looking at emotional level, cognitive level, or physiological health level. And to focus of this talk, and I think overall, you know, mental health purposes, if you look at the emotional impact um, of poor sleep or sleep deprivation, all these things, mood fluctuations, somebody having irritation, frustration, um, increased use of stimulants, whether it's caffeine, whether it's the stimulant substances, as well as high risk of abuse with alcohol or other drugs, um, illicit drug use, a lot of time depression leading to overall worsening of mental abuse plays a major, major impact. Cognitive level, big time impact, no matter what age it is. I see that among kids uh, growing up. Again, as I was saying before, I mean, a lot of times kids get diagnosed these days with poor attention, attention deficit disorder, a lot of times they are also on medications for that. We see the same thing with adults as well as older adults. And a lot of times is poor sleep, just not sleeping well, whether it's trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep, it leads to impact on memory, attention, concentration, reactivity, and overall productivity and performance. And physical impact, we reviewed that earlier already with all the different body system that can be affected by poor sleep. So um, when you look at, the, look at the sleep deprivation, there are a lot of things that can cause sleep deprivation. This is another slide again that I share with my patients in my waiting room or, or in general when I'm sharing with uh, patients, a lot of things can affect sleep or sleep deprivation. Um, starting for things which I think matter or are common or common in general, one of the common ones is insomnia. Insomnia is trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep which is something that is continuous at least about three months or so. And if it affects about two to three nights per week, then that can be a major problem. Increased stress at work, increased stress at home. A lot of time people who do shift work disorder, um, they don't always realize they have done that for years. They start doing that in their younger age and they keep doing that for several decades. And then eventually it takes a, takes a toll on their mental health and sleep in general. A lot of times things which are physical conditions or medical conditions like narcolepsy, where somebody has increased sleep in a tendency for falling asleep during the day. A lot of time it can be genetic. A lot of time it happens after having a viral illness like a cold or flu or stomach upset, creating antibodies in, the, in, in your you know, blood system that can eventually attack the part of brain called hypothalamus and then destroys these substances that eventually allows us to stay awake called hypocretin. These are the things that can, call, uh, can cause narcolepsy. Other things which are very common are obstructive sleep apnea. A lot of times it's commonly used the term as sleep apnea, where somebody has trouble sleeping at night because they snore a lot and they, uh, they basically stop breathing while they are sleeping. All these things can eventually affect sleep. 
sort of what we call as sleep fragmentation or break the sleep rather than maintaining that sleep cycle that we uh, discussed earlier, it is disturbed and then leads to a lot of sleep deprivation and related effects. Um, insomnia again remains, it remains one of the commonest sleep disorders all over the world and often not recognized, not reported um, and just not something that is discussed a lot of times by, uh, by physicians. Uh, these days when you know uh, primary care doctors or physicians in general are seeing their patients, a lot of times the focus is directed on taking care of blood pressure, blood sugar, labs. However, sleep or how good is the sleep quality is not something that's always being brought up by the patients or physicians because of other things which are out there. Um, and I think this is something that routinely should be should be used. Uh, you know, overall, this is being this is being assessed more frequently than it was all over the world by physicians. Um, a lot of times the questionnaires are given to the patients or people who are coming for the first time evaluation at the office. How good is your sleep? Are you able to sleep in time? Are you having trouble falling asleep? Because anything that affects falling asleep or staying asleep uh, and lasts for about three months or longer, and if it is happening at least two, three times a week, that is not a normal behavior. And that is something that is called insomnia. Again, it could be acute from something that happens in someone's life um, if there is a loss of a loved one, if there is a stress that is happening at home or work environment, or these days, um, again, with COVID, uh, this has uh, uh, played a major role uh, in sleep and insomnia because people having stress about work, about uh, you know risk of uh, catching infection while at work. I have seen so many patients being stressed with this, not being able to sleep, uh, plays a major role. Um, and insomnia I mean, in general leads to effects on the behavior. Sometimes, a lot of times patients wake up with headache in the morning, have low energy, the performance remains poor. A lot of times concentration is an effect as well, um, but this remains a commonest uh, sleep disorder, uh, no matter what age, uh, younger, younger kids, adults, as well as older adults um, are suffering from this. So something that, you know, I would like to bring it up so we can share with other people and, and I think more awareness needs to be out there for insomnia. Obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea is something that um, I think many people are familiar now. Somebody who is uh, snoring loud for a long time and just uh, waking up at night um, uh, all the way till someone who is having trouble breathing while they're sleeping and literally sometimes being described as gasping or choking while they are sleeping. If you look at in this picture, the picture on the top is the normal breathing, no matter whether you're breathing from the nose or mouth, the air goes eventually into the lungs through the windpipe or trachea. And the passage that the air has to go through is right behind the tongue, right behind the nose. And if someone has muscles or the airway that continues to collapse or shut down while they are sleeping, will definitely keep waking them up at nighttime, whether they are aware about waking up at night or not. When we do sleep studies or testing while they are sleeping, we see them, some patients wake up anywhere from 60, 70, 80 times per hour. So you're looking at the brain waking up that many times per hour, causing that much sleep deprivation. And then you can see the impact on their mental health uh, overall, which has been going on for years. So again, one of the commonest, the commonest disorder, which is not always recognized. What can be done uh, to improve sleep quality or sort of focus on better sleep for better mental health? A lot of stuff is out there. Uh, if you go online or read books, uh, fortunately, there is a lot of awareness. However, this is, the, this is some of the tips that I share with my patients, which are, which are available from World uh, Sleep Society. There are tips available from American Academy of Sleep Medicine as well. And it starts with the simple things, uh, maintaining a routine, which basically mainly involves waking up at the set time in the morning as much as possible. Uh, that can make it a little bit difficult for some patients who do shift work. However, as much as possible, establishing a routine is the key. If, if they are doing shift work or not able to have enough six, seven, eight hours of sleep, then taking a scheduled nap is something that is very helpful as well. Avoiding any kind of you know um, substances, alcohol especially, close to the bedtime. 
plays a major impact. I tell my patients, at least to avoid that two to three hours before the bedtime is possible because that will definitely induce sleep. However, it will disturb the sleep cycle and then they will wake up halfway through the sleep cycle and that'll make it very difficult to fall asleep and long-term use makes a big, big impact. Uh, caffeine intake or stimulant substances, better to avoid as much as possible close to bedtime. Diet, heavy carb diet, heavy sugar diet definitely has a major impact. Workout routine is something that I discuss with a lot of patients having sleep uh, uh, troubles and insomnia. Avoiding workout routines close to four to six hours at close to bedtime is the best thing to do. Uh, however, these days timing becomes a challenge, um, but as much as doing that makes a big impact. Um, temperature plays a big role, comfortable environment, noise and light obviously plays a major role. And one of the major one for insomnia is to avoid using bed for things like reading the books, watching TV um, or other things and keep the bed for sleeping and sex purposes only. Overall, you know, keeping that mindset and the routine makes a big difference. Um, an eventual goal remains to maintain this cycle um, because as you can see again, as I discussed before, that anything that throws a particular individual in this vicious cycle that impacts the sleep just continues to add sleep deprivation and keeps making overall you know, uh, sleep quality worse no matter where we are. Um, so um, I, I, I think this is, this is really good that we are discussing mental health because um, this is one of the areas that is often not looked at and more awareness, more attention needs to be paid no matter what age again, whether it's you know, um, uh, kids, teenagers, or older adults, the importance of having sleep routine, importance of recognizing the problem when an individual is suffering slum sleep issues is very important because it can have a short-term impact in their health and as well as long-term impact affecting various various body, uh, you know, uh, physiologic body systems um, and can have a lot of impact. Um, so um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll stop here, Sheila, and uh, just allow some time if you know, um, if, if you have any particular questions uh, or areas you want me to cover uh, and then, you know, we can kind of uh, go from there. Is that okay? Absolutely. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the effect of caffeine on the, the diet. Um, do you want to um, change out of the screen share so we can see your wonderful face? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, is so, that, uh, there you're is, back. is that okay now? Is that better? Oh, good. good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I was so, just uh, looking at lasagna, lasagna recipes. Sorry. <laughs> I was just reading that wheel of that circle and I was like, oh man, yeah. how are we going to get out of this wheel? <laughs> so yeah. um, a lot of people don't realize that caffeine has such a huge impact on sleep. Um, true. If, if you have a cup of uh, tea or coffee at like noon, it can actually affect you up to the point that you're sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And is there anything else diet wise that people need to be avoiding to sleep better? I think uh, you, you bring a very good point, you know, because this is something that again, really uh, not often paid attention to. Caffeine has a caffeine has a big, uh, huge impact. Um, and I think um, um, even, you know, I, I can share my own learning with caffeine. Uh, I, I changed my caffeine behavior, I would say probably about three, four years ago. And I just started to pay attention, you know, that amount of coffee, tea, chai that I was having and just adding it together throughout the day. Um, I, it was it was a lot of caffeine and um, even even the times that you don't realize and just cutting it back makes a huge difference. I noticed it myself. I've talked to a lot of patients. So caffeine definitely is a major major you know a source. I would say probably if you're going close to close to about you know 200 milligram of caffeine a day, which is about close to three cups of coffee. That's already moderate amount. And anything higher than that is very high. But even, even having about 150 milligram, which is about a couple of cups a day, you're approaching that moderate amount limit. So probably try to keep it 150 milligram per day is probably a safer way to go. Uh, so that's about a about couple of cups of coffee. Obviously, depending on the size, you're, you're looking at the large, you know, uh, venti size coffees, then that's one cup enough is going to 
get you there, but two small cups will do it. Um, other diet, I think you bring a very important point um, that uh, it's a huge area that's not always paid attention to. Um, and the diet that can make a lot of impact on sleep are high carb diet, high sugar diet, uh, has a major impact in terms of insomnia because it directly impacts the physiological system. When you are taking a high carb diet or high sugar diet, you are putting, you're stimulating the entire system, your circadian rhythm, especially at nighttime, which is supposed to stay on the down, down low. So our circadian system is built in a way that as we start to go to sleep at night and when we are sleeping, all our hormones like cortisol, insulin, ghrelin, all of these hormones, which are supposed to be on the lowest level possible because that's where the activity stays low. So our heart rate is low, our breathing uh, number, your respiratory rate uh, per minute is low. So the entire system is sort of starting to wind down. So having a moderate amount of carb diet can make a big, you know, overall would be probably better for the entire system. But if you are having a high carb diet, high sugar diet at night, especially, it's going to wake up the entire system that is trying to sleep. Um, and that's mainly your cortisol level, uh, insulin uh, hormone, and those will have a better, a major impact. So avoiding that will make a big difference. Uh, there is some data about um, overall, uh, you know, avoiding soy content as well. And a lot of time, you know, a lot of these days uh, we see people increasing high protein diet or, uh, you know, high soy uh, intake diet. And we have seen several patients having insomnia with that as well. So especially nighttime, avoiding um, overall, uh, you know, soy-based diet has some data that it makes an impact well for better sleep and overall, you know, um, less impact on uh, sleep deprivation. So yeah, those oh, things I'll that's, recommend. That's, that's so interesting. I did not know about soy. Um, I also was reading that caffeine, uh, different cups have different amounts of caffeine. Like you think That's like, right. okay, well, then, you know, you can have uh, one kind of brand of coffee can have such a high level of caffeine compared to another brand. And mm. a lot of people don't realize that just because you're having a small little bit of coffee doesn't mean that you're not having a huge concentration of caffeine. So we have to be aware of that. Absolutely. I think uh, that matters. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no worries. And then you also brought up the, um, the, the, the topic of, of the amount of sleep, but it's also very important, the timing of sleep. And um, a lot of studies are saying going to bed around the 10 o'clock time is the, is the best time. Is that something that you're suggesting to your patients? Yeah, I think, you know, timing is something that I often um, discuss with a lot of patients. And, um, you know, a lot of, lot of research is being done about uh, timing and a lot of this comes uh, from, from people who do shift work because um, if you look at sort of quote unquote normal sleep time, which is something that is acceptable or understandable is some, somewhere around 10 to 11 p.m. to 6 to 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, um, you know, uh, that time is something that is uh, considered as a normal time. However, people who are doing shift work, working at night, or starting to work in late evening until early morning. And these days people doing a lot of international work, especially in the technology industry. So where you know you and I are in the, uh, in the Bay Area, I see a lot of patients, a lot of people um, who are working across the world, um, starting their work at 10, 11 p.m. because then they are starting their work in the tech industry with the rest of the world, whether it's Asia, China, wherever they are working. Uh, they're working all the way up in the morning um, and their sleep cycle is completely different. Um, and uh, so um, there have been a lot of research being out there about the timing for sleep. However, we don't have a lot of, lot of sufficient data um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, if someone is able to have six to seven hours of sleep in a 24 hour period, whether they are doing it during the daytime or nighttime, but if they are doing it consistently, if their timing is not changing, for an example, somebody who's doing shift work three nights a week, they will sleep during the day for three days and the rest of the time they're trying to sleep at night. Now that is something will have impact on their sleep and timing becomes a challenge. But if they're able to maintain the schedule, whether it's daytime or whether it's you know evening or nighttime, uh, but if it is consistent over periods of time and that's what they keep doing, then that's something that will not necessarily have impact on their health. 
But when you are changing every three, four days, every few weeks, going from let's say 10 to seven, and then you're going to two to 10 in the morning, two, two, uh, you know, 2 a.m. to 10 p.m. a few days, when you are interchanging that, now that is something will have a, a lot of impacting sleep deprivation because our circadian rhythm, our brain will have very difficult time adapting to one particular schedule. Um, and that's where, you know, it takes a lot of stress and uh, it only gets worse and it takes us back to that vicious cycle with poor sleep and insomnia. That is why um, they notice when the, the time changes, um, there's such yeah. an increase in the amount of heart attacks that happen because um, people are cutting out that hour of sleep, right? Absolutely, yeah. There is some data out there um, uh, you know, and, uh, and that eventually leads to sleep deprivation to heart disease and poor sleep and poor sleep time has a major, major impact. Uh, and it starts with high blood pressure, starts with a regular heartbeat, uh, congestive heart failure, as well as, uh, you know, coronary heart disease or heart disease in general. So a uh, major impact with cutting down the hours of sleep, uh, especially if you're looking at less than six hours, that has a major impact on long-term basis. And uh, on top of that, if you, if someone has um, problems like sleep apnea, there are dips in oxygen uh, during the time when that happens uh, with pause in the breathing, and that has impact on top of that. But just sleep deprivation alone, uh, less than six hours, has a major impact on high blood pressure, heart disease, heart attack, um, as well as risk of stroke. We also see a lot of people having stroke and coming in with stroke um, when you have that less than six hours sleep for a long time. Yeah, major, major impact. Yeah. And Dr. Chirag, we have a question coming in from a, um, a viewer and she's asking about cat naps, taking naps um, during the, the day. Is that a good idea just to catch up on sleep if you're tired? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, cat nap or naps during the day, I think is something that plays a role. There is some data and scientific evidence out there that uh, in a period of 24 hours, if somebody is able to do less than six hours in a stretch, but if they are able to do scheduled consistent naps during the day, then that definitely helps and is better than sleeping less than six hours in a 24 hour period. So I often recommend a lot of my patients who, um, who somehow um, are not able to sleep close to six hours um, at night, whether it's work or whether for other reasons, I will encourage them to find the time during their workplace um, or other locations to try to take a nap. But if that's something that they're gonna do, I recommend them to do on a scheduled basis, not something that, you know, take it when you need it, because with that strategy, what happens is that there are a couple of days in a, you know, a few days goes by where they will not feel like taking a nap or they'll try to fight through. And then that sleep deprivation again kicks in. So if that's the strategy, a lot of patients I recommend they are gonna take, a lot of people are gonna take, they should do a scheduled nap um, and, you know, I always, uh, um, uh, it, go, it goes back to a lot of countries from the, and our ancestors, right? Because uh, taking a nap in the afternoon has been a routine, um, but a lot of times it's done on routine basis. And they've done studies. They've done studies on um, people from Asia, India, Asia, as well as Southeast Asia, that, you know, there is a culturally, they take a nap in the afternoon and they've compared the degree of heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and they've compared that to, you know, uh, patients who take sleep less than six hours and evidence has been out there that, you know, catching, having that scheduled nap will make a difference. So if that's the strategy, then I would recommend doing it on a scheduled basis, whether it's 2 p.m., 3 p.m., uh, whether it's half an hour, 45 minutes, but it has to be done on a scheduled basis. And that, that plays a role that adds up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, that, that's, that's so, um, that's so amazing to, to be able to talk about this kind of topic, especially at a time like, like this, because sleep is such an issue. Um, I do wanna talk about um, ADHD with children. So I noticed in my practice, we have um, patients that come in and they have a very closed jawline, which means there's a lot of crowding and they don't get that much um, sleep. And then at school, their teachers are telling them that they're being disruptive and they are ADHD and and on that spectrum. And then we are able to actually straighten their teeth and open up that, that, that um, jawline and then 
things are actually getting a lot better for them at school. So it's really important out there if you do have a child that is um, snoring, for example, or has a lot of crowding that you do get it evaluated from the dentist to make sure that there is enough space for the tongue and the tongue isn't being pushed back into the mouth and the child is getting sleep deprived. Because one of the ways it's turning up is lack of concentration at school. And you know, there's children that have been going through years and years and years completely being misdiagnosed with ADHD, yet um, all it was is they're just not getting enough sleep. Is that something you're seeing in your practice, Dr. Chirac? Absolutely. I think you bring, you know, topic that I continues to, you know, continue to preach and encourage. Uh, um, so whenever I see um, adults suffering from, um, adult patients suffering from poor sleep or snoring or sleep apnea, I often bring that up to ask them about their children that, hey, how are your kids? How old, how many kids do you have? How old are they? Are they sleeping okay? Is any of them snoring? Because for the same reason that you brought up that with the jawline, because if someone has a smaller lower jaw in general or lower mandible, then they have a chance that their their kids or children are likely to have that same same jaw structure as well. And for a child to snore on a regular or consistent basis, no matter what age they are, is not normal. If they're having an allergy episode, if they're having a cold and they are snoring for few days, few weeks, and they go back to the normal breathing while they sleep, then that's completely normal. But if this is something a child does, snores all the time, then itself is not a problem that should be recommended. It should be evaluated. These are the guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, as well as the Pediatrics Academy. Um, so it starts with there. A lot of times, snoring is something that is not often noticed in, in a child or is not always often reported but it is seen being affecting their sleep and other things that you mentioned, poor attention. And poor attention is something that uh, is seen by a lot of parents when they're trying to go through a particular stuff like homework or trying to uh, read a storybook or try to just talk to them and you will see the child is just not interested, not paying attention, trying to kind of, you know, um, uh, having attention all over the place. A lot of times teachers will notice in the school, uh, concentration, irritability, um, a lot of times getting, um, getting angry or frustrated with simpler things on a regular basis, all common telltale signs that a child is not sleeping well. And a lot of times it could be related to snoring and sleep apnea. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times they get, they get directly labeled and diagnosed as attention deficit disorder. A lot of times they're together, a sleep disorder and attention deficit disorder can be together, but a lot of times they get treated for attention deficit with different medication therapies and sleep issues are not always addressed. Um, and in these cases, diagnosing a sleep disorder like sleep apnea in a child plays a major role. And the treatment is very effective. Um, the commonest treatment for this one and most effective is looking at their tonsils and adenoids. If the tonsils and adenoids are large, then removing them makes a huge impact. Uh, it really improves their sleep quality improves their mood, attention, um, their oral mental health, oral physical health. You can even see the impact in their sports they are playing um, or their physical energy in general. Um, and if the tonsils and adenoids are removed and addressed and they continue to have this problem, then addressing their jaw structure or teeth structure makes a big impact. Um, and I, I encourage a lot of parents to go and talk to their dentist when you know, they have, they have gone through tonsil removal, they're still snoring. I talked to a lot of orthodontists, I work with a lot of them to work on expanding their upper jawline, especially before age 13 or 14, because before that, the jaw, upper jaw structure is still something that can be uh, moldable or you can make an impact on the shape and try to open it up. After age 13, 14, it becomes a little difficult, but it's still possible. Um, and then focusing on you know, they're expanding their jaw structure than necessarily aligning their teeth at that age makes a big difference. So yeah, I think, I think dentists uh, play a major role in this um, because they are directly looking in their airway. Um, I, I work with a lot of pediatric dentists um, who will look in the airway, notice their upper jaw or teeth line is very narrow. They will ask the parents, hey, does your child snore? And yeah, I'm like, okay, you gotta go get it checked out. So 
I think dentists play a major role in, um, uh, and I'm sure uh, you and I have talked about this before, the American Dental Association have come up with very strong guidelines to encourage dentists to you know, um, uh, uh, interact with parents, discuss this, but I think it plays a major role uh, to recognize this and treatment makes a big difference. I've seen in a lot of kids, I've seen um, that make a big difference in them. Yeah, absolutely. Even with the adults that have sleep apnea, a lot of people think when they see sleep apnea, they're worried about having to go to the sleep doctor and then getting this big machine that looks like Darth Vader. Yeah. And yes. we, you know, in our, in our dental office, we're able to make a mandibular advancement device, which is just something that just moves the mandible slightly, the, the lower jaw is the mandible, we're just yeah. moving it slightly forward so that it gives space for that tongue to, to, to kind of open up a little bit so that you can breathe a lot better. And that's been very effective. Which brings me to my next question, which is, yeah. Dr. Trek, there are some, some general hints that you could be having sleep apnea. Um, can you just share with us what, what that could be? The snoring you mentioned, okay. and there's some other things, which is like circumference of the neck, for example. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, um, uh, sleep apnea is a commonest disorder. You're looking at um, one to two, one to two uh, men out of every 10 men, no matter what age, will have some degree of sleep apnea. Um, one to two out of every 15 to 20 women uh, will have uh, some degree of sleep apnea. And after age 45, 50, um, even one to two women out of 10. So the, the risk becomes pretty much equal among men and women after age 50 among women. Uh, so very common disorder. Um, snoring is the commonest sign. Um, uh, snoring that happens again on consistent basis plays a major role. Just waking up at nine, nighttime for no known reason, just being awake and not being able to sleep. One of the biggest telltale signs. A lot of times you don't have a lot of symptoms at nighttime when you sleep, but symptoms are seen during the day. As someone who's tired, someone who has low energy, um, headache when you wake up in the morning. Um, having poor concentration, poor attention, need for naps in the afternoon, and you feel like your energy is gone, no matter how many hours you sleep, whether it's six, seven, or eight hours, but this feeling of being tired all the time uh, is a major, major sign of having sleep apnea. Um, whether, whether somebody is overweight or not, it's common among uh, individuals who are overweight with BMI higher than 25, BMI higher than 30, but no matter what age, um, jaw structure plays a main, main role. So regardless of weight, these symptoms uh, play an impact. Um, a lot of times it, they are seen uh, in someone who is having sleepiness while they're driving. A lot of uh, car accidents happen or truck accidents happen because somebody might have underlying sleep apnea, which is not diagnosed. So um, a sleepiness while driving, falling asleep on the wheel, one of the major signs for sleep apnea as well. Um, and diagnosis is something that has become very easy. Um, we usually, we used to do about, you know, close to uh, five to six years ago, sleep studies where we test patients um, while they are sleeping only in a facility or something is called a sleep lab. We still continue to do that for specialized condition, conditions and treatment. But nowadays, a simple test at home called home sleep study can be done where monitoring of oxygen or breathing is done while you are sleeping at your home and it can detect a lot of patients with sleep apnea, especially when it's significant degree of sleep apnea. So diagnosis has become very easy, is very accessible uh, all over the world. Um, uh, a lot, lot of you know, treatment, a lot of uh, centers are out there to do that. Reaching out a physician who's specializing in sleep disorders um, uh, makes a big difference to start this conversation and get the testing done. Treatment is also become very, very uh, accessible and we have started to know that what treatment works for what age, for what subgroups, um, you know, uh, it, it all depends on how bad is the sleep apnea. If somebody has mild degree of sleep apnea, something that happens, somebody stops breathing about five to 10 times per hour, oxygen level doesn't dip very low when they sleep, then in those cases, they can be treated with a mandibular advancement device or dental device, just like what, uh, you know, Dr. Sheila is mentioning, that can be option for them well, they will bring the lower jaw forward when they're sleeping at nighttime, opening up that airway behind the tongue so that we can have that space to breathe in and out that we looked at the picture earlier, which was collapsing. Um, somebody who has moderate or severe degree of sleep apnea, 
they, and they have health conditions affecting their blood pressure, heart, diabetes, the dental device are not the first line option for those patients. Um, but in those cases, using a machine like a CPAP or BiPAP can be used. Um, machines have advanced quite a bit too. They used to be um, really loud and noisy. Um, and nowadays they are small, quiet, and also the mass will become very small, but we still see one third of patients who are not able to use them no matter what we try. So there is this 25, 30% of patients who will not be able to use the machine, which basically gives pressure to the mass to open the airway. Um, and it's the best way to treat, most effective way to treat, but a lot of times one third of patients can't use it. So in those cases, we'll go again to use the dental device, focus on weight loss. Um, uh, we'll also consider surgery for some patients. They have large tissue, very bulky tongue, large tonsils uh, to do whatever we can to open up the airway. The surgery is still not very effective, but again, a good option if the best option is not working to do something about it because not treating is not an option. As you could saw, you saw already that it impacts the health, mental and physical health. And these days we also have new options like using a stimulant or a pacemaker, which will implant if somebody has tried the machine like a mask or CPAP, dental device, um, or a surgery is not an option and they can't use any of this treatment, then we'll consider a pacemaker or a, or a device that will place with an electrode that stimulates the tongue when you sleep at nighttime. Um, a stimulus is given in a way that will not wake up the patient, but contract the tongue so the tongue stays forward. Uh, and that treatment is also available now. Um, a lot of times we'll just try to do a combination of all these treatments, but um, it, it's good to discuss this, good to bring awareness because um, recognizing somebody has sleep apnea is the most important thing because no matter what treatment you can do, it's going to make some sort of impact rather than just leaving it alone and letting it stay there for years and years and a lot of times um, there is a lot of end organ damage, uh, somebody who ends up with a stroke, heart failure, and those things are uh, unfortunately not reversible at that point. So um, uh, treating, recognizing and treating sleep apnea um, it plays a major role in preventing a lot of the things and overall better mental and physical health. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really important just to touch upon it again, because one of the risk factors for adverse out outcomes with COVID-19 is diabetes and obesity. And, and yeah. you, you've got this cycle where you're not getting enough sleep leading to these potential issues. So we really have to sleep super seriously and start looking at that. So I encourage our viewers, if you do feel like you have sleep apnea or any other sleep issues to reach out to your physician and there is help out there. Um, and I do wanna use this great opportunity to, I, I, we've got two great doctors. So we've got Dr. Nora, that's um, a host for Healing Our Earth. And we have you, Dr. Chirag. And I do wanna have some interactions because She's a mental health expert. She's a Dr. Nora oh, is a professor in mental health, and um, she's also a scientist and a motivational speak speaker. So, having a chance to kind of communicate here and um, giving our audience um, some some great value would be wonderful. So, Dr. Nora, how are you doing? Are you there? Hello, Dr. Dubé. It's a pleasure to be on Healing Hour. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. I know that you're really busy during this pandemic because of the huge increase of mental health issues that are out there. So um, since there's a good link between um, mental health and sleep, um, let's, let's get some questions and answers out there and get these two experts to give us some great information that we can take home. Absolutely. So, so, and I know, Dr. Nora, you had a question for Dr. Chirag. Um, do you mind sharing that? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Chirag, for th this really fascinating talk. Um, I had a question relating to the neurobiological perspective of insomnia. So what kind of research has been carried out um, which provides an underpinning of what causes insomnia and what can someone do? I mean, I think I'm thinking more about the wider audience who may be suffering uh, currently during the COVID period of insomnia, maybe staying up really late into the night, not because uh, they're busy working on something, but maybe because they're just trying to keep themselves busy watching movies and just, you know, keeping their mind busy. And uh, before they know it, they're up until one or two in the morning. Um, so what can they do? And is it a problem? Uh, what, what's the solution around insomnia? Thank you. 
Thank you. No, I, uh, thanks so much. Uh, uh, nice meeting you virtually. Um, thanks so much for the input. And uh, no, I think you bring a very good, very good uh, point. Um, and you know, um, insomnia, as I was saying again, um, remains the the commonest uh, commonest sleep disorder. And one of the commonest, which is you know, um, uh, unfortunately, not always recognized. So one of the most unrecognized sleep disorder uh, affecting all different ages. So the question is, what is the neurobi you know, neuro neurobiological research and impact and connection there? Um, and you bring a very good point. This is where last just two, three years, the entire paradigm has shifted in treating sleep apnea and understanding the neurobiologic uh, you know, connection for insomnia. Um, until just recently, we always have focused on neurobiologics um, or chemical transmitters that play impact in basically leading to sleep. What are the factors uh, that actually you know, induce sleep? And there's very, there's very similar pathway they may have understood um, for someone who is you know, uh, basically um, uh, an alcohol abuser or using alcohol for a long time. Because what it happens is the neuro, neurotransmitters will overall start the cascade, uh, including GABA as well as serotonin. And it will then eventually lead to inducing sleep and starting those different sleep stages that we discussed. And the whole focus in research has been around what can we do to stimulate those? What can we do to stimulate that GABA cycle so that someone can fall asleep and will not suffer from insomnia trouble falling asleep? And that's where the entire pharmaceutical industry, the entire medical therapy for insomnia has been focused you take multiple medications, which have been out there for years, whether you start from melatonin, whether you start from something like zolpidem, something uh, with aciplocon, all these agents have been focused on that. However, over the last two, three years, the research has shifted. And a lot of these research comes from understanding how we treat patients with narcolepsy. Um, what we have learned over the years is that neurotransmitters uh, like hypocritin, is a major transmitter that is produced by hypothalamus in brain, which basically plays a major role in keeping us awake or for us staying awake. And that's what it's lacking in someone with narcolepsy uh, because someone who has narcolepsy lacks hypocritin and then that will basically cause sleepiness during the day, induce REM sleep, causes paralysis, all the symptoms. So now the focus on understanding insomnia has shifted in the same pathway because we have focused on years and years that we need to treat or induce the systems which leads to sleep. However, what about blocking the factors or understanding the factors which pushes this, push these patients to stay awake when they're trying to sleep? And how about working on the pathway to sort of tone down the hypocritin? How about blocking the hypocritin pathway which forces this patient to be awake because we understand, understood in the research that patients with insomnia have hyperactivated hypocritin pathway, which is supposed to be sort of on the down low based on our circadian rhythm, whether they're sleeping at nighttime or late at night. Um, and blocking that pathway plays an important role in treating these patients with insomnia. And that's where the exposure to light comes in. So the focusing on how much light they are exposing to themselves in general, especially starting in the afternoon hours, evening hours, or late night, um, you know, plays a role because that will induce their hypocritin pathway. It will push their awake pathway they are dealing with. Um, and I think our treatment is shifting sort of blocking towards that. Um, but when it comes to modulating all this pathway, medications are out there, but they have not been, not been the frontline therapy. They have not been the best way to treat it. The best way to treat it still comes down to modifying the behavior, looking at the stressors, and then again, focusing on getting the circadian rhythm back in the order. And that's where cognitive behavior therapy comes in the picture. So at the end of the day, patients who are suffering from insomnia, especially if they have trouble falling asleep, cognitive behavior therapy, working on the behavior which focuses on waking up on the same time, no matter what, whether it's a weekday, whether it's the weekend with a little bit of variation up to half an hour, one hour for waking on the same time, fixing that wake up time is the number one key. Number two is not forcing themselves to go to bed when they are not ready. Somebody has talked to a lot of patients who are 
will say, you know, all my life I've been able to fall asleep um, at 10 p.m. And then uh, for the last two years, something has happened. I can't fall asleep. I still go to bed. I'm really working hard and I stay in bed for two hours. I just can't fall asleep. So basically something took place that shifted their circadian rhythm uh, or their overall sleep cycle where the brain is just not used to falling asleep early. So in those cases, you just have to step back, try to relax, try to find things to do other than just forcing yourself to sleep. So basically delaying that sleep time when you're going to bed plays a major impact. And then the last thing for these cases to do cognitive behavior therapy is focusing on something called worry time or basically trying to identify the stressors early evening, three to four hours before you're going to bed, trying to think about factors that are going to impact your sleep, whether it's work-related stress, whether it's stress because of other things. Some people I encourage them to write them down if they're comfortable. Some people talk them through, come up with a plan to solve them and then allowing your brain, your, uh, your overall you know, uh, self to tell them, you know, you, you'll come up with a plan, you'll solve, uh, solve it later or next day. Now you're thought through about this. Now you gotta go into this buffer zone to try to relax and focus on sleep. And this ongoing treatment is the one that has been shown to make a major impact on insomnia compared to other medications. Um, uh, so we always try to do more cognitive behavior therapy and often assist with medications, uh, now focusing more on blocking the pathways to keep them awake rather than necessarily you know, inducing the sleep. So I, I hope uh, that summarizes uh, some of your questions, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, because um, when we look at individuals with uh, child or adolescent onset uh, psychiatric disorders, yeah. we find that sleep is, is also disrupted in these young children, um, particularly when the research has been carried out, they've compared those who are poor sleepers with those who are good sleepers, and they found um, that circadian uh, dysregulation may be one of the causes, in addition to many other factors, environmental risk factors, genetic factors, which may uh, lead to many of the worsening of symptoms in, in the patient. So it's really fascinating. Thank you so much. It is, yeah. Very fascinating, Dr. yeah. Dr. Chu again, Dr. Nora. So one of the things that I'm noticing is the amount of um, issues that are happening because of the devices that we have, right? So there's some good parts of devices, for example, the app, like for there's, there's a lot of uh, apps out there that actually can help you sleep because it puts your brain in a, in a calmer state. You can listen to certain kind of music that will help you kind of sleep better. But there's a lot of people that are just on their devices just before they go to sleep. And there's a lot of blue light that comes through and it, it, it kind of activates the brain so that you can't fall asleep. Can, can, can you both talk about that a little bit of, Dr. Nori, are you finding that's an issue? And Dr. Chua, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so in terms of um, what you should do before you go to sleep, um, there's been quite a lot of research in this area uh, where they've suggested that the first thing you need to do is probably an hour or two before you go to sleep, just ensure that you're not watching anything which has high frequency. So things like, um, let's say it could be a, a violent movie or a TV show that tends to disrupt um, how you feel like emotionally. So something that will make you unstable. Um, remember that before we go to sleep, our frequency is actually really, really low. It's almost like delta theta levels, which is significantly low. So in order for us, just before we're able to get into the sleep uh, rhythm, uh, if it's disrupted, so if we're quite high up over here, it's going to take quite a long time before we can get into the state of sleeping. And I think that Dr. Uh, Chirag will be able to give a better insight into this. Um, but in terms of physical things that we can do, I would say keep your phone, if it's charging, great. Um, if it's possible, leave it outside your room. If it's close to your uh, bedside, it's not necessarily considered to be a good thing. It's always best to keep it away. Um, keep it on charge and make sure it's on silent. Uh, some people forget to keep their phones on silent and what happens is because we're international we've got relatives all around the world it means that our phone goes ping you know multiple times at night um, because we're all on different time zones so it's important to keep it on silent um, but like I was saying what are we doing before we're going to sleep um, one thing we could do is maybe read a book listening uh, to some soothing music 
um, something that you like to listen to, or maybe having a chat, as long as it's very positive. Um, those kinds of things should definitely help our sleep just before, um, yeah, prior to sleeping. Dr. Chirag, anything you want to add to that? Oh, I think you're, you're on mute. Yeah, so I was trying to unmute. The host has not allowed you, so I was waiting for host to give me that option. So thank you, host. <laughs> uh, no, I I, I think uh, I fully agree with Dr. Nora. Um, you know, um, I think I think this is a, a you know a commonest issue, and especially with uh, COVID and you know um, overall um, a lack of lack of outdoor activity, uh, whether whether it's you know whether it's um, uh, shut down in the area or working from home. Um, I think dependence and exposure to um, digital devices, especially cell phones, has just only gone up. Um, and um, it's something that is, um, uh, yeah, it's a very common issue. And I encourage the patients, tell them the same thing who are having insomnia or looking for better sleep health that you can do that. You just gotta dim your light, uh, cut down the overall light that out there bring that setting to night mode, uh, no matter what phone you're using, um, because it is, makes a huge impact having cutting down the light. Um, and similarly, if you are going to do that, try to do it outside the bed. You can do it in a couch in the bedroom, you can do it in the other room. Um, so that way your, you know, your, um, uh, your brain will eventually build that, build that relationship and still keep that focus. And when you are go to bed, once you are in bed, you're just going to relax and you're just going to sleep. So, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, it is okay to do that. Dim the light as much as possible. Try not to do it in the bed, outside the bed in the bedroom or other room as possible. And then you just turn it off, put it to charge, go to sleep. Uh, so I, that's, that's what something I encourage, yeah. You did just mention about the lack of like exercise. What's the role of exercise with sleep and the role of exercise in mental health? Right. Uh, I think exercise uh, plays a major, major impact. You know, exercise, our ent entire body physiology, whether it's breathing, whether it's, you know, cardiovascular system, everything kind of goes with our circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm is something that is directly linked with the sleep. So, um, again, the focus is once you are approaching close to your bedtime, especially the four hours, three, four hours before that bedtime, um, physiologically, everything starts to wind down. The heart wants to, you know, might start slowing down with the heartbeat. The respiration, breathing wants to slow down. Uh, blood pressure wants to go down a little bit. Everything is looking for that rest. Um, and when you do exercise during those three, four hours, you are doing exactly opposite to what your circadian system is used to or telling you to do. So you are working on increasing your heart rate, pumping up your blood pressure, increasing your respiration, and that is going to start to wake up the entire system cascade, whether it's your cortisol, whether it's your thyroid, um, everything's starting to go up when they are supposed to be at the lowest level during those 24 hours. And that is going to make a huge impact on sleep because once those systems are activated, they are unfortunately not like a light switch where you turn it on and turn it off. They will require time to come down and slow down to get back to your circadian rhythm. So if you wanna go to bed at 11 p.m. and you're doing a workout at 9 p.m., um, your system is all charged up and you go to bed at 10.30, you're gonna be all like, you wanna sleep, you know you're tired, but your brain is, sorry, you already activated, I'm gonna need some time to calm down. So um, that, that plays a major impact. So you, you wanna do exercise if possible, three, four hours, preferably before four hours you're going to bed and mental health, uh, mental health is just only going to get an impact and take a toll because um, in, in, this, in this particular case, um, uh, not having that enough sleep, the stress of not being able to sleep and then working on forcing yourself to sleep is only going to make the anxiety concentration and take you back to that vicious cycle that you are going to be caught up in. So um, huge impact, uh, having an exercise routine, preferably you know, three, four hours before bedtime is the ideal way to go because it may not have immediate impact. You may be able to soldier through, but eventually it will take its toll because you are just trying to go against the physiologic circadian system 
but at the end of the day controls everything in your body. So that's what yeah. it comes down to. And even um, sleeping in a room that's a little bit cooler also you know, actually yeah. helps you sleep better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Temperature. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to put everything together so that everybody sleeps together. Anything there I've you go, yeah. <laughs> throw absolutely. it all in there so that get, get our viewers and everybody to, to sleep a lot better. Um, we have a question from Dr. Nora from one of our viewers. And the question is, for anxiety, what role does mindfulness play and uh, meditation? Okay, well, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think it makes a huge difference. At the moment, I, we're going through um, lots of challenges. Um, and so currently, I would say it's almost like we're in a turbulent period. Uh, we're experiencing uh, emotions like anxiety and stress. Um, and meditation can play a really, really important role in this. It can calm the mi mind. Um, also using simple things like maybe uh, deep breathing. So breathing in and deep breathing out just for a few minutes, it can really play an important role. Um, I don't know if you've tried and we can try now if you'd like. Um, yes. if, we, if we take, um, if we just relax, okay. And uh, I didn't plan this by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what life's all about. <laughs> yeah. So, just so let's, have, let's have all our viewers kind of take a moment and join us in this little practice, just something that you can learn and teach others also. So let's all sit together now. So you don't need any, any sort of special positions like a lotus position or any yoga position. It can be as simple as a sitting down here like I am. And just so you can keep your eyes open if you'd like, or close your eyes, however you think is best. And take a deep breath in through your mouth and deep breath out. And then try again through your nose. So deep breath in and deep breath out. And once again, deep breath in and deep breath out. Now, if you practice this for a few moments a day, it could be in the morning, which I'd recommend, you can release a lot of the stresses, any underlying anxiety, which you may be facing. Now, typically in the morning, the beautiful thing about the morning is that we have our reset button on, right? Throughout the night, our mind is such a beautiful um, organ in the body. So it really allows us to just declutter anything that's in our mind, that's beautiful. So we start off at zero. What we sometimes do, so we wake up in the morning and what, what is the first thing we do in the morning? We check our phone or maybe the phone, the alarm goes <laughs> off, right? The alarm, the phone that we should have kept outside. <laughs> so um, that the phone goes off and what happens? We we turn it off and then suddenly we see all these messages on the screen, all these forwards, and then a forward links to some YouTube video. And then what do you know? Um, we're watching a video and we've only just woken up. So what we need to do is not to check our phone in the morning and just make it a point that I'm not going to check any messages. Um, if possible for the first hour, so this is assuming you wake up a tad bit early, um, and just say, I'm not going to check my phone. Yes, the phone will get me up, but that's pretty much it. And then go and do what you need to do in the day. Preferably come up with a routine. What exactly do I need to do today? What are my tasks of the day? And this is all before you check your phone because it allows you to not get disrupted. One of the reasons why we get disrupted is because there's someone, someone says that we need to do something. We've got a priority list of what we need to do on a Monday morning. And so don't get diverted, have a focus, have an agenda, and try to ensure that you get through those tasks, even if it's writing things down in a diary. And then once you've done that, then by all means, check. What is there? Is there, some, is there a message for me? Do I need to do something urgently? Um, it might be family related. It could be something more socially related. Like, do you wanna come next week somewhere? Well, it, you know, do I need to see that in the morning? Probably not. So these are the things I think we could probably uh, try to introduce in the early mornings of the day, just to keep ourselves empowered. 
because we tend to have 100% of our energy. We're like a battery, just like our phones. We tend to, you know, I've got my phone here. We charge our phone and we, we get super anxious when we run out of battery, when we're on 10%. Um, and we know this a lot with our you know, the little ones, our, our nephews, for example, when they have their iPads and their batteries on 5% and it leads to a lot of stress. Where's the lead, you know? Um, so one thing we can do for sure is to keep ourselves that charge, right? And this meditation I was mentioning was more like a mindfulness meditation. It focuses on relaxation and on breathing. Another thing we can do, um, which, if, if you'd allow me, I'm happy to show and maybe go through a meditation, which is almost like going on a journey, right? So I'd like to, if, if you're happy with that, I'd like to just go through a short meditation with all of you. Um, so that's just like you to tune in. Um, I'm going to put some music on in the background and hopefully you can hear this music. Can everyone hear that? Yes. So I hope you can just relax. We'll start off with taking a gentle breathe in and out. A gentle breath in and out. Another breathe in and out. We're going to do a meditation which may help you to let go and become free of all the weight on your shoulders, all the heaviness in your thoughts and in your feelings. So, I'd like you to imagine that you're walking along a country lane and you see a path along the lane. So you turn in to the path where you can see in front of you a beautiful field. It's wide, it's spacious, with one or two trees. It's a pleasant, and very relaxing scene in front of you. And in the middle of the field is a large and colorful balloon, which is tethered to a basket by several ropes. You walk over and the sign on the balloon and basket says welcome. And so you climb into the basket and you begin to untie the ropes and allow the balloon to lift from the ground. Slowly Gently, your balloon gains height. You look below and you see the fields and houses becoming smaller and smaller. And as you gain further height, Everything becomes quiet and very peaceful. You feel this quiet and you enjoy the space you're in. 
And as you go higher, you begin to feel a great sense of tranquility. You have left behind all your old worries and concerns. Up here, there are no thoughts, just a sense and feeling of lightness and powerful serenity. You know that whenever you wish, you can return. But right now, you feel yourself with peace and love. And you realize that as you head back to the real world, you can spread the love and peace that you've experienced up above. Thank you. Wow, that was really relaxing. <laughs> And this is going to be recorded on online, so at any point we can go back and kind of just use this and um, get into that nice relaxation state. Um, I know it's time for Dr. Chirac to leave us now, so I just wanted to say thank you so much. I know you're going to be out there spending some time. It's uh, what time is it? Ten o'clock in the morning there in California, so you're going to spend some time with your family. Thank you so much for your time and Namaste. Thank you for. I know you took away so time from your family to be here with us and share your great knowledge in, in sleep. And and can you just let the, let us know, our viewers know how to, um, do you have a Facebook page or anything that they can kind of learn a little bit more about the work that you do? Sure, yeah, I, I have a Facebook page uh, under my name and uh, Instagram as well, uh, C Pandya MD. And uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, Neil and uh, Sheila has my contact. Uh, feel free to reach out. Anything I can do to help, contribute. Um, and uh, thanks again for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Kirak. Go enjoy your wonderful day. Bye. Yep. Thank you. So now it's me and Dr. Nora. <laughs> so Dr. Nora, I have a question from another viewer in um, New Zealand. Her question is, She's suffering from quite a bit of uh, anxiety and depression, and she's also really concerned about her elderly mother who's in her 80s. Um, she feels like she keeps worrying and she can't kind of get her mind um, to, to rest, and she's feeling like very anxious. Do you have any um, help or advice that you could give her? Well, thank you so much for the question. And um, thank you, Martha, so much for sharing your inner feelings. Um, I think at the moment, it's so important that we, we get validation uh, and we, you know, we're able to validate our feelings and emotions. And the best way we can do this is by talking to people. Um, the evidence suggests, uh, according to the Office of National Statistics, that there's approximately 4 million adults currently um, during the pandemic who are experiencing always feeling anxious or often feeling anxious. It's a common um, experience and it's an unfortunate one, um, but it's something that we're all experiencing because we've, we're in a pandemic. Uh, we're not sure what's happening. Things are seem really uncertain. Um, even in addition to that, we've got other stressful life events. It could be stressing about work, um, the fact that many of us are working from home. Uh, we might be worried about our finances. So there's lots of trigger points, lots of uh, factors which may make our anxiety a lot more excessive or exaggerated. And 
So there are lots of things we can do uh, to help ourselves improve these underlying um, anxieties. Some of these could include deep breathing, which we practiced earlier. So just taking a simple, it's very simple, it doesn't require any tools, but just taking a deep breath in and out and practicing this for a few moments. That's been strongly recommended um, by many clinicians. Another factor is that if you like anything relating to aromatherapy, uh, for example, having a candle or a scent, uh, it is, does uh, release a lot of stress. Um, we sometimes practice this um, in the mornings. It does help. Uh, it could have certain scents like, you know, lavender or sandalwood, and all of these tend to be around the house, and it just generates um, anti-stressful uh, anti um, energy. So that's a positive thing you could do. But also, going for a walk. Often at the moment, because we are in isolation, and you mentioned uh, your mother, who's 80 years old, and it's uh, for her even, it will be very, very difficult. Um, I don't know in terms of mobility, um, but going for a, a, a walk, it could be for a few moments, even just uh, looking outside in your garden, um, looking at the beautiful colors, let's say, of the flowers and just the, the, the sunlight and the sky. These simple things, I know they may seem straightforward, but these are the little things in our life that can really make us feel um, just that things are going, everything's going to be okay. I'll be okay. Um, with time, things will improve. Um, I'll give my own example. Um, we, you know, obviously I'm spending time at home. We're currently in lockdown in the UK and um, hopefully there'll be a lifting from the 2nd of December, although that is a hope. Um, there could be an extension. And so what I do is I go out in the garden. I, I spend time out there. I look at the, you know, it's a bit cold here at the moment in the UK, but it's just nice to be outside. It's nice to take a walk. Um, you can even go for a run, something which involves some, you know, something external, um, because it can really de-stress you. Another thing I'd suggest is writing down your thoughts, your experiences, um, and this tends to help um, the feelings of anxiety come out of your head, because sometimes we don't talk about how we feel, um, and so writing how we feel does tend to reduce this underlying anxiety. If, however, um, you sense that this anxiety has been going on for a very long period, let's say uh, an individual is experiencing generalized anxiety disorder for approximately six months. And I know we've been in the COVID and the pandemic for over six months now. So if you've been experiencing, anyone who's tuning in today, if you've been finding that you're anxious pretty much all the time, um, this could mean that you may be experiencing a generalized anxiety disorder. And this is when a person has difficulties in um, managing uh, stress, but also if there's nothing really to be stressful about. So there's no triggers in the environment. The individual continues to express or feel worried uh, and feel anxious. So what we can do in these situations is to connect with a clinician, to reach out um, to a clinician, it could be a general practitioner, and to talk about these issues. Sometimes nowadays we, we're in a situation where we uh, get a telephone uh, uh, consultation. That's fine. Um, many also get quite anxious uh, about the feeling that, oh, why should I bother my doctor about this? Um, I'm feeling worried. Is that something I should pester my doctor with? Well, absolutely. Um, even if you don't get an appointment within a week, just continue, just make sure that you get that appointment, even if it's after three weeks. Um, seeking help is, is completely okay um, because that's the only way you can get some form of advice. Um, it might be through talking. It might be simple, like, let, let's talk about this. Or it could be where the clinician will say, well, I think uh, uh, a medication, a uh, psychotropic medication would help you in the short run. So the solution is there. Um, additionally, many individuals may even experience panic attacks. So just having a feeling of, of danger, um, a panicky feeling that typically happens during the pandemic. We don't know what to expect. 
in the news uh, late in the afternoon, we often get these headlines from the government, which are daily briefings about what action we need to take uh, in order to, uh, for the coming weeks. And this can lead to a lot of anxiety. It can make you feel quite nervous, maybe restless. It tends to increase our heart rate. We, we may even feel uh, sweaty. Um, and palpitations may be quite high. So all of these experiences happen because of the unknown. So these are some of my tips that I'd suggest um, to Martha. Um, but in terms of other factors like loneliness, um, we all experience loneliness. Um, and what, what can we do about that? Well, first thing I'd suggest is checking in with a family member. Um, it could be something that you do regularly, just staying in touch. I mean, if you don't have a phone, um, then of course, like a mobile phone uh, to do a video call, you can always choose to quite literally pick up the phone and connect with your loved ones. And believe me, you'll find that many people the fact that you're calling them, it's gonna encourage them to contact you as well. It's also a fabulous way, I think, during the pandemic, and especially if you're feeling lonely, to connect with old friends. I don't know if, you know, and if any of us have done that, but I certainly have, you know, just connecting with people that you haven't been able to speak to for a while. It really does help. Uh, we've been really bogged down in work and sometimes over the weekend and particularly during the pandemic uh, where we may have a sense of loneliness. It's always great to just connect with your friends. Um, Additionally, we can also go out for walks, like I mentioned, uh, but also how about doing something you've never done before? Maybe if you're interested in, let's say, learning how to make pizza from scratch, how do you actually make the dough? Um, that's a good question. Um, there are, there's so much advice on YouTube. And of course, sometimes they have lots of live Instagram events where they say, let's learn to cook. And, you know, ta-ra, you know, it's pizza. And you're there and you're, you've got the ingredients and you're making a pizza. So things like this um, can really, I think, make you feel quite happy and uh, quite fulfilled. And of course, you're connecting with the outside world. So that's, what, that's always going to be a positive thing um, but also reading uh, writing cross stitch I mean I'll give you an example I've got a family member uh, of mine where I ordered it was a gift I ordered a Buddha cross stitch and uh, it kept them really busy for three months and uh, that person was my wonderful mother. Um, and she created this lo lovely Buddha. It wasn't small, it was actually huge. It was almost a meter, so it's quite big. Um, so these are the positive things we can do. Just surprise yourself, um, because in surprises, there's so much happiness. So th those are some of my tips that I'd suggest to Martha. Wow, that's that's so useful. Um, I know I started gardening. I had never done any gardening and I was so amazed when I put a seed in and I was watering it. And then after a couple of weeks, I'm like, wow, something is actually germinating and I could see the leaves. And I got so excited. And then I was there in the garden every day. And I what I found from that was the gratitude that I had for things that I had never thought about before, just like where our food come from. So I, I never thought about, you know, you know, I get an orange or a cucumber or something. And I'm like, it's just on my table. I never thought about somewhere someone's growing that and, and then it gets cut and someone's putting it on a truck and then it's going in my supermarket. And so I had this newfound gratitude to just even food. And I was, even now when I eat, I'm just like, I'm looking at food in a very different way, which brings me down to, the, uh, to talk about the importance of gratitude, um, just being grateful for what we do have. I mean, we do have so much to be fortunate about and that's why a lot of the um, motivational speakers talk about um, gratitude and practicing gratitude and writing a, a gratitude journal like in the evening just writing down even 10 things that you're grateful for is that something that you practice Dr Nora too? Absolutely um, I love being positive it's in my veins uh, literally I think it's so important to practice the sense or this attitude of gratitude it's the fundamental building blocks of, of all of us, of humanity, I think. Um, happiness comes from the little things in life. And through um, the pandemic, I've had lots of opportunities to reflect upon things that we should feel grateful for. Um, 
re you know, reflecting on what have you achieved so far? What are your plans moving forward? Having this positive vision about things going ahead and not thinking about what's happened. I think there's lots of lessons we can learn from the past. And uh, absolutely, we, we, you know, there's some mistakes we may have made, but it, I think it's about forging ahead, considering it, acknowledging those experiences, but also moving ahead with that enthusiasm. And I've had a personal experience where I found that just having that positive drive can, can change everything. Um, if you're determined, um, to achieve something and it's 100% like you're absolutely charged up to achieve something it will happen so if you so it's, the question is really that what are the thoughts that we're feeding our minds if we're saying that you know what I'm fabulous I'm the best I can be I know that seems a bit like, oh my God, narcissistic here, but uh, it's not about that. I think it's all about having a nice balance of um, being humble and at the same time, believing in your ability and believing in yourself for what you are, values that you carry, all of these things put together. That's what, you're, that's what you are. And so if you can believe in yourself and have that self-respect, that's what I think is happiness. Um, and of course, with happiness, I think another point that I want to do, I was just thinking about, is that who are we? You know, um, end of the day, we are this tiny little spirit, right? right? The state of consciousness. And within that state of consciousness, there's lots of virtues, things like um, happiness, kindness, humility, um, being angelic, so being a very kind individual. Um, and all of these qualities are within us. They're all inside of us, um, up, up here. Or, or wherever <laughs> and um it's all about charging that positivity within you it's almost like a light like when the, when the light is not shining very well you you tend to just clean it right you think oh no uh it needs a bit of a rub just in the same way when our soul or our spirit or that spirit within us that light within us when it's a bit dim all we need to do is just shake it and the way we can shake it is by saying yes i can do it i can do this and having that fist pump this yes three times in the morning i don't do this regularly religiously but i certainly do it when i'm going for an interview or if i have some major event that i'm attending i practice this this is me being completely honest um say yes i can do this and that positivity it, it lights this, it sort of ignites these neurochemicals that you probably thought you never had. Um, so this is something which I think would, you know, if I could suggest in terms of happiness and having that innate happiness is all within us, but it just requires um, us to pull the trigger and to have or sort of send out those positive thoughts. But it'd be lovely to know also, Dr. Dubey, because I've seen so much positivity in you whenever I've seen you on Healing on Earth, which is how we've met. Um, but it's just so uh, beautiful. So what would you suggest? What, what really excites you? So for me, um, I think one of the things that keep me positive is just having purpose in life. Um, my big thing is to help other people. I always look at if I'm going to meet someone, how can I empower them to lead a happy, healthier life? I mean, that's what, um, that's like the core of what I believe. Um, so for me, it's, it's having that greater purpose. So even joining a group like Healing Our Earth has been so great for me because it gives me a chance to, to bring together people I know, to help educate so many thousands of people. Um, the other thing I think is important is the gratitude. Like I do the gratitude exercise in the evening. I'm, I'm very grateful for things that I have, even if, you know, we all have bad days, but just having a gratitude journal, um, the breathing. I do a lot of um, uh, kind of breathing, breathing in and out and just calming myself down. And I do use a lot of um, things like a brain tap, which is an app that I use um, if I'm having difficulty sleeping and I just put it on and it kind of calms my brain. So, um, and then it always puts me to sleep. And there's, there's even things on YouTube that are free that you can use. Um, which has a certain frequency and it's just calming music and it just remarkably works really well. And I think if a lot of people are out there trying to um, show kindness um, to other people, um, 
it it really if you're if you're always trying to think what else can I do to help somebody else I think it really makes a difference and that and that, I think that's what that, that's what helps me a lot and um, I think that's uh, that's what we all should do is just find something that we can kind of do to to help other people and then you find so much joy in in life in that way and um, I, do, I do have another question Dr Nora I am not letting you go that easily <laughs> We have a lot of um, people that around the world that have been messaging and the questions that they're asking are mainly about their children. There's a lot of um, anxiety and depression with the, the younger generation, especially that teenage age, because they're not able to go out. They're not able to um, interact with each other. They're having issues with their schooling. Do you have any specific advice for the teenagers and how, how can parents react um, to their children. One of the questions we had was um, sometimes the, the kids getting kind of angry and just almost disrespectful to their parents and how do parents approach their teenage children? Yeah, that's a really important question and uh, considering that we're all um, at home, uh, that includes, you know, let's say partners or and kids, it does become a, a, quite a major challenge, I would say. Um, it's an important question. And what I would suggest is uh, for parents to validate, again, validate um, your children's feelings and their thoughts and give them time. Give them your time uh, so they feel that they can share how they're feeling. I think many kids may um, get upset or angry because there's something which they're feeling and they're not able to express it. Um, maybe they don't have the platform to express it. In other words, um, you know, you, not, you don't have an opportunity to express it. There's lots of things happening um, in the household and that doesn't allow them to say, you know what, wait a minute, you know, guys, can we, can we talk? Um, that may seem a bit disruptive for them. So what can we do? One suggestion um, which I'd, I'd give is that we have a, a day in the week which allows parents to say, you know what, this is family time. And during family time, what we do on a Saturday morning or a Sunday is that we sit down as a family and we talk about how the week's been going. That is a strategy which has actually worked in my household when I was growing up. And it just gives a wonderful opportunity for everyone, all siblings, including parents, to talk about anything which may be bothering them. It also highlights some of the challenges. So there might be things like, let's say, um, this is quite deep, but things like bullying, for example, uh, bullying which may be happening at school. Now, if you're experiencing this sense of bullying, um, children don't necessarily express those feelings almost instantly. In fact, they might find other ways of expressing it. And that could be in the forms of anger. Uh, it could be them locking themselves in a room, um, not responding to you. And you'd think, what's going on? I haven't done anything as a parent. I've, I've been actually supporting them along the way. But the answer to that question is that, well, they need your time. They need your attention. So. You could every night or maybe when they come uh, back from school, uh, you could potentially ask them, how was your day at school? Um, what did you learn? Um, who's, you know, who did you speak with today at school? So very specific questions, not generic questions like, um, did you have lunch? Because they're probably expecting you to ask, ask that question because you probably ask it every day. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, kids are really smart. They know you're gonna ask them, how's your day? And you're gonna say, my day was great when, when it wasn't and um, another thing is that did you have your lunch yes I've had my lunch but if you ask very specific questions then you will start to see some of the struggles um, in, in the young person and so have that time give yourself even if it's 15 minutes give yourself that time towards your um, the young person your, your son your daughter and on a weekly basis, you can do this more often if you'd like, but on a weekly basis, do you have a time where you have, it's the family time. That will certainly help because it allows each individual to have their time to talk about things that they're experiencing, any challenges. 
Wow. So that's my, my suggestion. And then um, we do have to cover the, the elderly. Um, what's the best way to kind of help them feel supported? The, the people that are kind of isolating, the, those above 60s and 70s and 80s, what can we do to help um, give some joy to, to the, that age group? Sure. So if, um, if you are living with, with, an, with an elderly person, uh, what I would suggest is give them love. Right. And it doesn't have to be um, a hug because, of course, we're doing the whole social distancing and it does become really difficult. Um, but at the same time, uh, words, kind words, loving words is certainly something that a person can feel. Right. Um, I'm sure you're feeling the love as well online, all of you tuning in. And it's because that's what it's all about. So through your words, um, you can give the sense of comfort. If um, the elderly individual is living separately, so if they're living in a different household to you, what you can do is just catch up with them, you know, give them a phone call, or give them a, a call, ask them how they're doing. Um, this really does generate this sense of, I'm not alone. There's someone asking uh, how I'm doing. Um, just uh, particularly during the pandemic, where we're all feeling really anxious, um, just like young people feel anxious and, and older people feel anxious. <laughs> Similarly, the elderly feel even more lonely and uh, have this sense of anxiety and even depression. So making that phone call and almost being predictable that, oh, it must be Nora on the call, that kind of thing. Oh, it's Monday morning, it's nine o'clock, it must be Nora, who, you know, things like that. And that is amazing. Um, having this, these times that you call, it could be even after work, let's say you always call and check up on your grandmother at 6 p.m. Those kind of routines can really make them feel uplifted. Um, it's all about love. I think with the elderly, um, I, uh, it's something which, which they can feel, even if it's on the phone. If, if you can't video call them, you can call them and even five minutes, 10 minutes of your time can really have that positive impact. Oh, thank you so much. Dr. Nora, I think I could probably spend the whole day just talking to you and getting advice and, and input. Um, I know that you're a host for Healing Our Earth and just thank you so much for your time. And I know we'll be hearing a lot more from you. Is there any final words that you'd like to say to the audience just to kind of help lift their spirits? Absolutely. So I hope that all of you are able to have this sense of just love and kindness and you know, just, just try to bring out all the goodness. I think we, we have it within us, um, within ourselves. So we don't need to go out looking for, for love and happiness. It's all within ourselves. And so, you know, I wish you all the very best, um, particularly during these times, which are really, really challenging. I think all we can do is share love and happiness. And I'm sure that over the coming months, things will start to improve. Um, but don't try, don't get bogged down. Don't get bogged down on all of this because these are all external. And I think we are more than that. We can get through this. We've got through the major depression. We got through World War I and II, for example. We can do it. So stay strong, uh, stay connected with your loved ones. Don't forget about yourself. If you're going through any challenges, please do connect with a loved one or of course, do connect uh, with your doctors and they will certainly be able to help. But we wish you all the best and have a lovely, lovely weekend. And Dr. Nora, how do we connect with you? I know you have an Instagram uh, account that you post a lot of inspirational quotes on. What is that account? So the Instagram account, which I started during the COVID period. So this was my new initiative, which is quite lovely. Uh, I got me a chance to connect with many people across the globe, which is lovely. Um, it's mental health underscore connect. It's an Instagram account. And um, I'm also on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash mental health connect. So please do connect uh, with me. I am organizing a live event uh, this week, which focuses on mental health and fitness with uh, Vinod Channa, who is a celebrity fitness instructor. Uh, Bollywood, may I? May I? <laughs> so, um, he'll be joining me. Yeah, he'll be joining me this week. 
So it'd be quite exciting to know about things relating to how you can, uh, you know, improve your nutrition, um, but also general well-being. Great, yeah. I, I also started my Instagram account, which is Dr. Sheila Dobie, where I'll be posting a lot of Instagram um, inspirational quotes too. So I'm glad we both started our Instagram accounts. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's really important, particularly during these, this time where um, we, we are, you know, we are really kind of in a turbulent period, uh, lots of challenges. And so it really does. If you've, if you've got it in you, uh, why not share the happiness and kindness to others? So thank you so much. That's wonderful to know. Thank you so much. And this brings my time to an end and um, concludes this, this day of healing our earth. And I just want to say thank you to all our facilitators and thank you to all our viewers out there. It takes a lot to come on and, and organize such an event and week after week after week, providing you this amazing platform and just being here for you. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you facilitators for all the hard work that you do. Please note that our next session will be on Sunday the 29th at 2 p.m. till 6 p.m. It's a global meditation session. So please join us for our next session of Healing Our Earth. Namaste.